the Community College of Student Council, I want to thank you all for coming here so early this morning on a study day. Um, it was about five, six months ago I approached Gary about doing this and he said no. <laughs> and he proceeded to say no to me for the next four months until about two weeks ago. Um, and I think I speak on behalf of everyone in this room when I say that I'm so glad you said yes. Um, <laughs> so, here's present his last lecture, um, a man who needs no introduction, Mr. Gary Lepensky. Start just traveling along. 
I stand by elementary school days and in Minigan and started high school in a little town called Red Rock and ended up here back in Geraldton. Um, Geraldton Thomas in high school. This is almost the whole building. It's shaped like a T a little bit. There's students who go to that high school who travel 80 kilometers a day one way just to come to school. And being so far up north, they don't even see their hometown in daylight through the winter. Well, some of those towns aren't great to see anyway, so they're really not nice and much of them are really favorite. But this is your own promise in high school. And you know, I was a kid. And we were a pretty good football team. 
We got beat for three days and nothing. <laughs> but you know what? I was involved. It was exciting to be a part of that football team. And I kind of had a little bit of involvement, and I, I had the interest in learning. But the other thing that the city offered me <laughs> was this lady. And it was say, she was a hockey movie. You know? <laughs> This is my wife, Laura, and we have been married for 42 years. <laughs> the interesting thing in, in this whole thing is at the end, at the end of my university career, um, I was an academic All-American, and I was an all-conference athlete. And you know, why was I that? Because I had a destination, I had goals, and school was easy. School was fun. And the, the other thing I gained from that, in my senior year at our athletic awards banquet, this was our guest speaker, Jesse Owens. Um, during the Berlin Olympics, he won four medals. And this was the time of Hitler and his dominance. And, you know, and so it was very, very difficult um, in this particular time to have a black man receive four medals. And one thing that Jesse Owens said, and I will remember this, this day, he said, your life is like my medals. He said, if you just stop your life and you don't live it anymore, your life will become your medals like your metals, they will tarnish and they will lose their lust. And I remember that statement. And I thought, wow, that's all I have to do now is win an Olympic gold medal. <laughs> so, another important goal that, from Superior, Wisconsin, then I wanted to go to physio school. I had major surgery on me when I was 15 years old, and, and I was told by doctors that I wouldn't play a hockey game that year on the was in December, and I was back playing gold in February. I was impressed with this guy called physio school. I was never encountered one. Um, I wanted to go to physio school. I applied, we applied. To every physio school north of the Mason Dixon line and from Iowa to the east coast of the US. I want you to know that I got turned down by every physio school north of the Mason Dixon line and from Iowa to the east coast of the US. I got turned down from Western. University of Manitoba told us that well, you can come up for an interview, but it's not going to do you any good anyway. So I thought, well, I guess I <laughs> I had two interesting rejection letters. One was from Ohio State. Ohio State said, because of your grades, we will consider you as an American because when they accept students, they have to go in-state as American and foreign students. So I got bumped up from the foreign student category uh, to an American. And then they turned me down. But it was a nice way because it wasn't, you know, one of these check blocks. You know, you you are not accepted. <laughs> I got a lot of those. And the other good rejection letter I got was from Science College in Boston. Dear Mr. Kripinski, thank you very much for applying to Science College. Your marks are very very competitive, but I regret to inform you that Science College is a woman of the university. <laughs> I was fifth on the list of the four. I 
person with a PhD in anatomy dropped out before school started. You. <laughs> And it was interesting because I, I had only been to Southern Ontario once in my life. I took the train to Oldfield to see my sister. I didn't even know what it was anymore. We had no money. We had no money. Uh, so <laughs> I sat on the train on the bus for 31 hours to get to London. I got off the bus, and the bus station was on York and Richmond. I didn't even know which door to go out of the bus station. I had to ask somebody what bus do I take to get to West. I didn't have a place to live. I had nothing. Nothing but an angel that sat on my shoulder and said, you're okay, we'll, we'll, we'll just try. I got, eventually, I got a place to live. It just so happened that a guy that I played hockey with down at Wisconsin State University, there was a message for me to phone up. He married a lady who was my wife's high school friend in the high school in Wisconsin. And he said, hey, I hear you're going to Western. Yeah. I hear you don't have a place to live. I no. <laughs> he said, Mary and I just moved into a, a new townhouse here on Spring Street. We have an empty room. Do you want to come and live with us? I'm a condo. And this is where the physio school was. It was in Middlesex College. Right where Brad Puthers. It was down in the area. And it was down and through the area. So the physio school was there for a while, and then it got moved to University Hospital. And like all physio schools, it got moved right between the pool and the morgue. <laughs> That's the only place to put a physio department in physio school. But it was a delight. It was a delight to be here. The hardest part was being away from wife, and we had a three-month-old son when I left, and I didn't have to back until December, and poor Laura had to put up with this screaming, calling kid, pacing the floor every night, and I was sitting in London, I guess, quote, enjoying, unquote. <laughs> um, I got home, and I saw this emaciated lady, and I thought, ooh, what the hell happened to you? <laughs> Finishing physio school, I went to work in Thunder Bay. Thunder Bay was great for us. It was close to Superior, Wisconsin, so we could visit Laura's family. And it was close to my family, who lived in Hibbing. Um, I loved the outdoors, I loved fishing, and so this was a great place to work. And the gentleman who was in charge of the physio department was a Scottish guy. And uh, he loved sports, and he allowed his staff to work sporting events and act just so attractively. And uh, I didn't stay there very long. I wasn't a very stable employee. Um, I lasted there about 14 months. And the reason why I lasted there about 14 months is this gentleman right here telephoned me in the physical department in McKellen Hospital. This is Dr. Kennedy. Dr. Kennedy had his own way of doing things. It was called my way. Uh, <laughs> um, this is Greg Marshall. <laughs> this is Ryan Clark and David Zahan. Dr. Kennedy loved football. And he phones me up, I think it was on a Tuesday afternoon. And he says, uh, small talk. And then I learned, he's had this conversation well. And then I learned that he, now we're going to talk about what I want to talk about. As soon as I heard well, I kind of lost facial color. And I thought, oh no, what's he going to say now? Where are we going with this? So, Talk, talk, talk. Gary, um, David Wise, who was the guy who was in the chief physio head athlete trainer position, has left Western. The position is open. And uh, I wonder if you knew that. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, I'm a Thunder Bay. And he, I said, no, I wasn't aware of that. Well, he says, we advertise in the Global Mail. <laughs> Dr. Kennedy, I wouldn't read the Global Mail in Toronto, let alone read it a day late in Thunder Bay. <laughs> and he says, your name 
has come up in conversations a number of times. And I'm wondering if you were interested. And I said, Dr. Kennedy, I'll tell you right now, professionally, you know, he's offering me one of the best jobs in Canada. I said, professionally, Dr. Kennedy, I'll tell you right now, I am so interested. I said, I, I, didn't, I don't know if you're aware of it or not. I said, I'm an and I have a couple of children, so it's not an easy decision. Always said, no, no, I, I know that you're married. Uh, and so um, you can talk it over with your wife. He told me about 4 o'clock on Tuesday afternoon. Why don't you call me in the morning and let me know? Call me in the morning. It was not a great night. Um, yeah, or I said, you're just shaking your head. It was not a great, great night. Um, obviously, the decision was made, and, and we, we didn't move down to London. Um, I'm deeply indebted to this man. Um, he, he, he just taught me, taught me so much. And we know that it's the Fowler Kennedy Clinic. Um, it started off as a Kennedy Clinic, and then Dr. Fowler became the, the guiding director of the clinic in, in his name now. But he, he was an instrumental man. He was a powerful man. He was a knowledgeable man. He was the first person who realized, for example, that you could not sew an anterior cushion together with a tour because that was a dead material. And he was the first person in the world to create a synthetic material that they had to sew to the anterior cushion. So he was a thinker. He was a doer. Uh, he was a con man. So here I am. I'm back into my home. My home for 35 years. Went there. Got into, you know, oh man, I couldn't believe it. I was trying to survive in this job. It was just brutal. I was so busy. It was so overwhelming. But yet, started to volunteer. This is a gentleman by the name of Peter Connick. He lives in Sault Ste. Marie. He has a number of clinics in both Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario, and Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan. Um, we were colleagues, and so this is one time when we were down in St. Thomas, and we were doing some volunteer stuff on injury prevention for the YMCA in St. Thomas, but it was important to get out into the community. Busier than heck, and I was constantly getting calls from high schools for PD days about injury prevention, but I did it. Because I, I truly, truly believe that it's important to volunteer. And I want you to reflect on this. I will reflect on this and what I have to say, and hopefully you can reflect on this for yourself. If I am not for myself, who will be? And when I am for myself, what am I? And if not now, The first part, if I am not for myself, who will be? Now, I was for myself. I was for myself big time. I was first person singular for myself. I was I, I was me, I was I was doing this, I was going here, I was. And it was very, very focused to me. And I got really a distorted attitude on how important I am in the whole scheme of things. It gave me a lot of opportunities of being here at Western and being asked to do things. And one of the first trips that I went on was to Bucharest, Romania, with the West team, when Romania was a communist country. My funniest story in Bucharest, we ran into some Brits. When a person came into Bucharest, into Romania, their money is called a lay. And if you were a tourist, you used to have to exchange $10 for every day, $10 US for every day you were going to be in the country. And you would get 10 lay for each US dollar. Athletes didn't have to do that. You were special. So we're out on the street in Bucharest the first evening, and we want to change money. And we ran into some Brits who came over on BOAC, that is not British Airways. But they said to us, you know what BOAC means? It means bring only American cash. Because they didn't want to exchange pounds and they didn't want to exchange American dollars. So we go out and we're changing money. You just let it sit up the top of your pocket. 
And these people would come up, ching, ching. How much? Twenty. No way. So we got this guy up to 25 to 1. The government's giving you 10 to 1. We're getting 25 to 1. Now, our two heavyweight wrestlers are holding this guy's jacket, one on each side. One of the wrestlers was 285 pounds, the other one is 310. <laughs> the guy who's doing our negotiation is now a lawyer in London. <laughs> Mr. Barry. And we're ready to start out for the game. The people are told you gotta to watch these people because they're really quick with their hands. So we all had donated some money to this pool and we get people oh, went great, great. So the guy counts off the money in hundred dollar notes and he gives them to us. We said, whoa. And the heavyweight wrestler didn't let this little snipe go. And Sean, our negotiator. And he says to the guy, you owe us 200 more. No, 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 he's, he's right. Hey, you owe us $200 more. And then he comes. So we give it back to him. Mm, not a good day. So he comes, he says, sorry, I owe you $200, 200 more. So he reaches into his pocket, he takes out two 100 notes, he puts them on the outside, he rolls the notes up, and he gives them to us. And the heavyweight wrestlers let him go, and he just drifts off into this ocean of people going down the sidewalk. We open it up, and instead of being a stack of hundreds, the only hundreds were the two on the outside, and all of the rest of the notes were fives. He slightly handed us. I mean, two guys are holding his shoulder. Our chief negotiator is looking at our women in the face. And he slightly handed us. So instead of getting a 10 to 1 from the government, we actually ended up getting 2 and a half to 1. And so this guy was going down the street telling the story, the funny story about the stupid Canadian wrestlers. Right? But we were in Bucharest, and we went up into the Carpathian Mountains in Transylvania to their sports training center. And the first morning I woke up, I looked up and it had, it had snowed. It was just beautiful. Uh, I found out that this man, uh, his job was to go down the street and shovel up all the sheep that we were um, on the street so people could ride their bikes and everything. And it was just a, a, a very tranquil picture and, and I took this. And I also learned about Romania training. They said, you know what, they're athletes. This is where we were staying, right here. And they said, you know, our, our wrestlers run up the mountain for training. This is a ski hill. And so in the summertime, we run up this mountain. And as you can see here, when you get to the top and you look down here, that's pretty high. But we noticed how their wrestlers trained. All the way along, going up, they were under trees. Sleeping, curled up in a little fetal position, just really enjoying themselves. And they indicated, ah, oh, why don't we want to run up this mountain? You know? <laughs> so this was their training. So here's the dumb Canadians again, running up the mountain, while the Romanians are sleeping under the trees. <laughs> um, but you know, in travel, it gives us a lot of opportunity, and we were allowed to go to places where the common person couldn't go. This is Count Dracula's castle. The Romanians do not like how Count Dracula is portrayed in Hollywood. He never bit people out of the neck and sucked their blood. He just killed his staff every once in a while. He was a tough paranoid. And he thought that there was a conspiracy against the Count so he would have all of his staff killed and he would hire a new staff. So, if, you know, the good news is you've got a job, the bad news is you're working for the Count. You know, one of those things. But just beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. And you know, the common person was not allowed in there. But the athletes were. It was an opportunity. Um, and just little things that you would see. How they do things, how we wouldn't do. Uh, what a great bread delivery vehicle. And, uh, <laughs> but these were just little things that we picked up. 
also had the chance to go to, and I'm not going to make this a travel log because it's totally, totally boring listening to other people and where they went, but this is the first time that Canada sent a medical team to a major game. Um, I was fortunate enough to be a part of that particular team, and it was in San Juan, Puerto Rico. Again, um, a learning experience, an absolute learning experience, but also a personal experience. I met this particular gentleman for the first time. His name was Bill Stanch. He's an orthopedic surgeon from Halifax. Just an amazing, great guy. And he was one of the dogs, just the regular dogs, in, in 1979. Um, I don't know why I'm just <laughs> <laughs> And on to Sarajevo. The tragedy of Sarajevo. Um, when we were there, it was beautiful. It was absolutely beautiful. And, and Tito even said, when Yugoslavia and Sarajevo got to bid for the Olympics, he feared for the country. Because as soon as the Olympics were over and he died, that the, the country was going to be split uh, in strife. But I was there with figure skating. This particular gentleman here is Brian Vistoli, uh, who has a clinic here in London. Uh, this gentleman's name is Steve Kane, uh, who's the head of therapist at Bishop's University. Very, 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 very beautiful city, and I just shudder at the thought of, I wonder what it's like now. I know the arena is totally bombed out, um, and it's just a couple of walls are standing, and they used it to store military vehicles. This is the first time my wife got to go home. She always wanted to go somewhere. So when the World Figures Campaign, Figure Skating Championships were in Tokyo, um, she came along. Um, Whenever I see a picture of a McDonald's restaurant, no matter what country I'm in, I take a picture, and I have this collection of McDonald's pictures. <laughs> <laughs> but the interesting thing is, it allowed us to travel and to see some of the good things in the country. And the thing is, what it also did is it cured her desire to accompany me to any games. <laughs> I was there to work, and, and in as much as I didn't work that hard, the work came at perhaps inopportune times when we were about to go somewhere to do something personal, and a skater would come up and, excuse me, could you look at, absolutely, I could look at whatever your problem is, because that's why you brought me there, and that's my job. Um, so that was the first and only time that Laura really ever accompanied me, but we got to see some of the beautiful uh, part just outside of Tokyo. <coughs> And then, so, this was my roommate. His name is Darcy Bain. He's from Winnipeg. We're great roommates. We found out we're from the same, we're both from Geraldton. Yeah, it's hard to believe that two people are from Geraldton and they're in the same room. <laughs> <laughs> and he had left Geraldton the same year that I moved back to Geraldton. Some of the therapists there, and you know what? You know what the new students got that one? Is we were the only country in the world that had the writing on our guard written in Korean. So the Koreans could tell, I mean, it's pretty hard not to know that you're Canadian. <laughs> they don't even know anything else. But they respected so much that we had written in Korean Canada. We're on our way, we're flying over to Seoul, and there's a message. That indeed is sweatshirt, don't wear it. Well, why? Well, the person who stenciled it, you know, if you're stenciling in Korea, how do you know which is forward and backwards? They stenciled Canada backwards on the sweatshirt. So we are now from the country called Adnac. <laughs> There's an Olympic Park. In this park, this is just, I took a picture of the stone. Canada brought a totem pole as a gift to the Koreans. And in this park, all the countries that participate bring a gift to the Korean people. And it's really, really beautiful. It's amazing. And it has this little circle of flags, and people are not allowed in this park until after the opening ceremonies. We would go for a run early in the morning. We try to get in the park. 
we get this machine gun guy standing there. <laughs> I'm going to be left around 5 o'clock in the morning. No, but I need to say the game. Yes! Around the, the lake. So we go in, we go over the first bridge, and we hear a whistle blow. And the soldiers started to drop out of the trees. <laughs>
I got to be very, very self-centered. I got to over-exaggerate my importance in life. My importance to me. Because, and when I am for myself, what am I? And that was a question that took me a long time to answer. It was a painful answer. Uh, there was a lot of personal strife within my home, but there was a lot there. And along that line, I am clinically depressed. I don't drink it for clinical depression. I didn't ask for it. I can know. I wasn't at Woodstock. I haven't done bad drugs, you know, or sniffed cans of lawnmower gasoline. You know, I just didn't do anything. My brain chemistry changed. I was depressed for many, many years. What I tolerated a lot. I would come to my office to work, I would unlock my office door, I would close it, lock it, I would sit in my chair and not move for four or five hours, not touch a piece of paper, nothing, just sit there. I would get up, unlock my office door, lock it back up, walk home and do the same thing. Be abrupt answers of yes or no. And you know what? People would say, hey, bend over and pull yourself up by your bootstraps. But they don't understand. The issue isn't the bootstraps, it's the bending over. I don't want to bend over. And then when the Lord would encourage me to get treatment, it was, oh, I can work through. I would get back. I'll be okay. Well, you know what? I was. It's hard to ask for help. Help is so easy. I would never, I would never, never, never want to go back to where I was. And I know there are people in here who are like me. There are people in here who have yet to ask for treatment. There are people in here who have yet to ask for help. But do it. Do it, please. I just wasted so many lives over the number of years by not asking for help. And that was a part of the discovery of me. And it didn't come from me. It came from my wife pushing me onward. Now, what am I proud of? Every student. Absolutely every student who signed up for my classes, every student who attended potlucks, every student who wanted to whoop my ass and flip cuts, <laughs> every student who viewed me as a mentor. And for some, who do you want to be? I'm very proud of that. My friend Walsh. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to believe that this is the thing I did not have to do. The same thing could be said for me over here. And for Brian to stop, now Brian's about the same. He's still that skinny little geeky Italian with the mustache. <laughs> uh, I always tell students that I laugh. Obviously, I thought so much of Walchi. It was important enough, uh, and it was a privilege to be asked to stand up for him when he got married. But I tell all the students, you know what? Walchi got married on the Valentine's Day. <laughs> How nauseating is <laughs> In 2003, I received this award. Very proud of it. Why? Because it was a student nominated award. I don't know who that student was. Don't know. But I do know that when these awards are bestowed upon people, number one, they have to be nominated. And it's just not like, hey, you got to write your name on a piece of Kleenex and hand it in. Uh, there's a bit of work that has to be done. So some student thought enough to nominate. 
and ultimately receive this award. And, and this one is so important because it's a student award. Although it says Bank of Nova Scotia, hey, somebody's got to pay for it. But, <laughs> <laughs> um, 2000 convocation in 2007, I received the Plumber Teaching Award. And that's the highest uh, teaching award um, that can be bestowed internally on, an, on a professor here at Western. And why is that one so important? Because that one was evaluated by the faculty. That was in the faculty. And to receive that, I, I, I found no way. That was the third time I was nominated. And you know what? I just hate losing. <laughs> and so I took it so personally when I was nominated and didn't get it. And I never ever thought I would get it. Why? Because I don't have a PhD. Why? Because I don't have tenure. Why? Because all of those other people research, and you know what? I don't research, and I don't publish. And so when I got that phone call in the morning, indicating to me that I had received the Pleb Award, I was floored. I was asking to be floored. I couldn't believe it. And I'm very proud. <laughs> senior person in the office, and when I was undergrad chair, Wendy and Dawn and Toba
to have this dedicated teaching area for abdominal injuries is as the people in physiology who are glad that I'm not in the Coca-Cola lab setting up tables where I'm disrupting the um, I think this adds to the quality of learning. I think this is a great facility. I think it will become a multi-use facility. And I can hope that this whole athletic injuries area can be expanded. I truly, truly appreciate that. And it was Al Samoni who started it, and it was Erwin who brought it to fruition. I really appreciate it. My great ideas. <laughs> this is our beautiful daughter, Shannon. Our grandson, Eric. Our son, Sean, who's a Excellent, excellent physiotherapist in the spine. He practices in here. His wife, Jill, who's a high school teacher. And this is Paige and Nora. Um, it brings a whole new chapter to your life when you have these little rug rats. I'm glad to have them, but I know that you really appreciate that they're not here today. <laughs> Nora, my kids, gave them to me. But I'm proud. Uh, This lady loved me. When liking what I stood for and liking what I did was very difficult. You know, going to an Olympic Games or doing that's being away from home for a month. You know what it's like to be away from a boyfriend, a girlfriend, if you're really close to your parents. You know what that's like being away for a month. Because a lot of you have been there. This is a lady who never said no to me. She should have. But her response was, I did not want to deny you the opportunity to experience this. Oh, what a noble person. And I did not appreciate till now how great that is. What a gift that was. Because that was difficult to her. She raised the kids. And you know what? I got grandkids. And you know what those grandkids are? It's God's gift to me. So maybe I'll get it right the second time. Because I really screwed up the first time with those kids. Because we're a race. I didn't have a great deal of time for Laura. I truly appreciate it. Laura, did you make this stick on your picture? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> and last but not least, This is such a thrill. This is difficult. Students have kept me young. I describe myself, as the years go by, as the stick who's just starting to dry up. I'm getting bent over. I'm getting gnarly. I'm getting all around. But every fall, there's these students come on campus. They have sparkle in their eyes. They're full of hopes, wishes, aspiration. They're excited. They're a river of youth. And somebody throws me into that river. And I'm swept away. Students keep me young. Maybe now I'm really going to go down the road. But because of these students, it has been a reason to give up. A reason to come to work. A reason to learn. And I thank you for keeping me young. Please become passionate about something one day. And do not be first person singular when it comes to if I am not for myself, who will be? And last but not least, goodbye. <laughs>